Today's topic is the Fourier transforming lens. And to get started, let's look at the situation in geometrical optics where we take as our input plane the front focal plane of a lens, a focal length f. And imagine we put a point source at point psi and eta. Then what happens? Well, this point source will create a set of rays emanating from that point. And we know because we're in the front focal plane that those rays will be collimated by the lens. And so we'll go from a point source to um, a set of parallel rays. But parallel rays in geometrical optics corresponds to a plane wave in wave optics. Now, if we think about the Fourier transform of a delta function, say delta of x minus psi y minus eta, then to be a Fourier transform, we'd multiply by e to the minus i, 2 pi, ux plus dy, dx, dy. And this would just sample this factor at x equals psi, y equals eta. So we would end up with e to the minus i, 2 pi, and we'll write it this way, psi u plus eta, v. Now, if we think of u and v as spatial variables, then this would be a plane wave. So that's kind of the connection between uh, a input plane in the front focal plane of a lens and a Fourier transform, because this would kind of look at look like what we have going on on here. We'll fill in the details as we go along. And of course, then if you had a, a, a source that was distributed throughout this plane, each point of that source could be considered as a delta function weighted by the amplitude of the field at that point. And so each point source with its own weighting would produce a plane wave. And so you'd have this superposition of plane waves. And that's kind of the picture we have in the, the Fourier transform point of view. So that's where we're headed. Now, before we can do that analysis, we have this question to answer. How do we represent a lens in wave optics? So we're going to have a picture that's going to look something like this. Here is the lens, and we imagine immediately before the lens, we've got some field G1 of X and Y, and immediately after the lens, some field G2 of X and Y, and how are they connected? Well, what we're going to do is to represent the lens effect as a transmittance function, T of X and Y, such that G2 is equal to T of X and Y times G1. That's where we're headed. Store that in. Let's revisit the geometry of a spherical lens. So this would be our radial distance from the Z axis. And we have a lens that's made of two spherical surfaces in the front surface, say, uh, has a center of curvature Z1 and a radius of curvature R1, which in this case, following our bookkeeping technique, would be greater than zero since the center of curvature is to the right of the lens surface. And then the back surface here, which would have a center of curvature, call it Z2. And in this case, the radius of curvature R2 would be less than zero because 
the center of curvature is to the left. So we're going to call the thickness of the lens delta zero. That's on the axis, on the z axis or the optical axis. And then at some height off the axis, that uh, thickness we'll call just delta. So let's work out the thickness of the lens because what's going to basically happen if we use the paraxial approximation, we assume uh, that rays are more or less traveling uh, approximately parallel to the optical axis. That means that plane waves would be propagating more or less uh, such that their wave fronts would be approximately vertical. And if the lens is very thin, we can say approximately the waves hit this lens and rays travel through more or less parallel to the z-axis. And so they undergo a phase change, which is going to be determined by the amount of free space they travel through and the amount of the lens they travel through. So the geometry here would be that uh, the front face, so this would be z front, and then this would be the back face, z back, the equation of the front face is that it's equal to z1, and then it, the real surface is to the left, so it would be z1 minus the square root r1 squared minus x squared minus y squared. That would be the equation of that part of that sphere. And then the back face, z back, centered at z2. Um, in this case, the faces to the right of the center point, so it would be z2 plus square root of r2 squared minus x squared minus y squared. And then the thickness at any particular height or distance r from the optical axis would just be the difference of these two z coordinates. z back minus z front would be that thickness. Okay, so that's the basic geometry we're going to make use of. Again, here's that geometry. Thickness on the axis of delta zero and at some height above the axis or off the axis, a thickness of delta. And we have expressions that look like r squared minus x squared minus y squared. So this would be r1, which would be positive, and this would be r2, which would be negative. And we're going to assume, it's in line with the paraxial approximation and the thin lens approximation, uh, that r squared is much bigger than x squared plus y squared. So this distance is much bigger than that distance. It doesn't look like it in this, this picture, but this is grossly exaggerated in the, in the various dimensions. So we'll pull out the r squared from under the square root. I'm going to be careful there because the square root of r squared is really the absolute value of r, given that r could be positive or negative. That leaves behind the square root of 1 minus x squared plus y squared over r squared. And now you know, we assume that this is a small quantity and then that allows us to use the approximation that square root of 1 minus u is approximately 1 minus 1 half u, Taylor series, first order term. And so this becomes magnitude of r times 1 minus 1 half of this, so that's x squared plus y squared over 2 r squared. And that is magnitude of r minus, now magnitude of r over r squared, well that leaves 1 over the magnitude of r. So that would be minus x squared plus y squared over 2 magnitude of r. So let's look at a point ZB on the back face. And that Z coordinate will be Z2 
plus an expression of this form with r2 as the, the r variable. So that'll be plus the absolute value of r2 minus x squared plus y squared over 2 times the absolute value of r2. But r2 is negative. So the absolute value of r2 is minus r2. So this then becomes z2 minus r2. And then a minus r2 here converts that minus to a plus x squared plus y squared over 2r2. Now for a point on the front face, we have z1 and then minus an expression of this form with r1. Now r1 is positive, so we don't need the absolute value. So it'll be minus r1, minus minus will be plus x squared plus y squared over 2r1. Now the thickness of the lens is just the difference of these two z coordinates, z back minus z front. And on the axis, where the x squared plus y squared term go away, we have just this expression minus that. So we've got a minus minus r1, so that's a plus r1. And then here we had a minus r2. And then we have z2 minus z1, uh, but z2 is to the left of z1, so that would be a negative number. So let's write that as minus z1 minus z2, which is minus a positive number. So that is the on-axis thickness of the lens. Now, what if we're off-axis? Well, we've got still the difference of zb and zf, so we'll still have the difference of these two terms and those two terms, which is the delta zero. And the only difference now is we have the difference of this term and that term, this term minus this term. So let's write minus this term as minus x squared plus y squared over two times one over r1. Okay, so that's the minus of this term. Now let's write this term as minus minus, so that would be plus. So minus minus 1 over r2. And this might look familiar. An expression like that came about in our description uh, of the lens in geometrical optics where we derived the power and the focal length of the lens. In fact, remember that the power of a lens, which is 1 over the focal length, is equal to n minus 1 times 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. Now, here is how we're going to derive the transmittance function of the lens. Here's the front face, the plane that includes the front face on the optical z-axis and that is a thickness delta zero and then at some height above that we have a thickness delta of the lens and using the the thin lens plus the paraxial approximations we can think of rays as uh, essentially coming in, uh, striking the lens and traveling more or less parallel to the z-axis, at least for this very short distance. The, whatever angle it, of propagation it has isn't going to cause very much of a change in the, the height relative to the optical axis here. And so from this front face there to that back face there, a ray is going to travel through delta lens, and then the remaining delta zero minus delta is through air. 
Okay, so on the axis, it's all through the lens, which has, we assume has index of refraction n. And if you're off axis, then you're through some air and some lens. So that will lead to phase changes equal to, well, the, from, for the air, it'd be e to the i 2 pi over lambda, and that distance through air, delta 0 minus delta. And then through the lens, it would be e to the i 2 pi over lambda. Now the n has an index of refraction of n, and so this would really be lambda over n, but we'll bring the n up stairs here. So n times delta. Or just another way to say that is, if a wave has to travel through a medium, a distance delta, if the index of refraction is n, you get n times as much phase change as you would if you were traveling through air. So let's rewrite this as follows. e to the i 2 pi over lambda delta 0, and let's combine the delta terms as e to the i 2 pi over lambda. Here you've got an n, and here is minus 1. Ah, that's the n minus 1 we need for the expression for the focal length of, lens, uh, of the lens, and then times delta. So for the phase change, we've got delta 0 and then plus n minus 1 times delta. Now let's put on the formula we had on the previous board for what delta is. So it's first a delta 0, and then it's minus, so n minus 1, that expression in um, x squared and y squared, which was, we'll write it this way, 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2 times x squared plus y squared over 2. Now we see here the expression from geometrical optics for the power of a lens, which is 1 over the focal length. So, finally, we have the transmittance function of our lens. Let's see. Up here, we've got a delta 0 minus delta 0. These two terms cancel out, and that just leaves n times delta 0. So that's a phase factor e to the i 2 pi over lambda n delta 0. And what is that? That is the phase change if you went through the thickest part of the lens right on the optical axis. Then we have this term here, which will be e to the minus i. It would be 2 pi over lambda, but we've got it over 2 here, so that gets rid of the 2 and the 2 pi, so that just leaves pi over lambda, and then this is 1 over f. And then that leaves then that times x squared plus y squared. So that is transmittance function of a lens. Now let's use our transmittance function to work out the impulse response of a single lens system. So here we have a lens. Here is an input plane. Uh, we'll have the lens a distance d1 in front of the input plane, and here will be an output plane a distance d2 behind the lens. To get the impulse response, we're going to put an impulse at the input plane. That will be delta of x minus psi y minus eta. Now, that's going to produce, we know that produces a uh, spherical wave that will propagate out, and then it will strike the lens. And then let's call the field right before the lens G sub A, and the field immediately after the lens, let's call that G sub B. 
course, the lens is described by the transmittance function we just derived. And then we got to figure out what happens uh, to the propagation after the lens to finally to give us the output here, which will be, by definition, the impulse response. H of x and y given an impulse at xi and eta. Well, the first part is easy. We, that we worked out. That was just an approximation for a spherical wave. So we know that g sub a of x and y is just e to the i 2 pi lambda d1 over i lambda d1. Or we could just put this delta function into the Fresnel diffraction formula, and this is what we would get. e to the i pi over lambda d1 x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared. So that is, the field is kind of the input to the lens. And then that goes through the lens, and so we get g sub b of x and y right after the lens, which will be this expression, e to the i, let's put the phase factors first, 2 pi over lambda, d1 over i lambda d1. And then the phase constant for the lens was e to the i 2 pi uh, over lambda and delta 0. And now the terms that depend on x and y, we've got up here e to the i pi over lambda d1 x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared. And then the x and y dependence uh, for the transmission function of the lens, e to the minus i pi over lambda f x squared plus y squared. So let's look at the, uh, the, the x and psi terms here. Uh, and let's leave off the, the i pi over, over lambda. So we'll have x minus psi squared over d1, that's this over the d1, and then here we'll have minus x squared over f. And expanding that out, well, we get two x squared terms. In the first one, we'll have an x squared times one over d1, and here we've got minus one over f. Then we'll have, let's see, a psi squared term here, psi squared over d1. And then we'll have the cross terms, minus 2 uh, x psi over d1, minus 2 x psi over d1. Well, we see that if we take d1 to be f, in other words, we take the input plane to be the front focal plane of the lens, then the, this x squared term will go away. And likewise, if we do the same thing with the y, y and eta terms also. So if we do that, we have no, no x squared or y squared terms. So we're going to do that. It's going to mean that the, the field will have no curvature. It won't... Uh, It'll just have linear terms in X, which correspond to a plane wave. So with that choice for distance D1, setting it equal to the focal length, the field immediately after the lens reduces to E to the I 2 pi over lambda d1, which is f, and then we also have a similar term with an n delta 0, so we'll just combine those together, over i lambda f. Now we still have the quadratic terms in psi and eta. Those are e to the i pi over lambda d1, which is f, psi squared plus eta squared, and then the cross terms, e to the minus i, and we had 2 in the cross term, so 2 pi over lambda f 
um, let's write it this way, x, xi plus y, eta. So the only x and y dependence is in this term, so that is linear in them, and that represents a plane wave. And the spatial frequencies would be, so this should be, if this was of the form e to the i 2 pi ux, well, the u would be minus psi over lambda f, and the v would be minus eta over lambda f. So our picture is, here's our lens, input point, and this emits a spherical wave, which strikes the lens, and is then collimated into parallel beams, which corresponds to a plane wave, propagating like so. So this is a distance f, this is a lens of focal length f, and now the question is, what distance d2 should we choose? Well, all that happens uh, after this point is that you just have a plane wave which propagates, we know how to propagate a plane wave. And in fact, that propagation, propagation of a plane wave is precisely what we called the transfer function of free space, which is e to the i 2 pi over lambda, the distance d2, e to the minus i pi lambda d2 u squared plus v squared. So let's uh, let's see. Look at let's look at lambda d2 u squared, and here's the u of this plane wave. So we would have lambda d2 u squared would be lambda d2 this squared, which would be psi squared over lambda f squared. And if we take d2 to be f, then this lambda d2 cancels one of these lambda f's, and this just becomes, oops, psi squared over lambda f. That's if d2 equals f. And that means this is going to be e to the minus i pi psi squared over lambda f. Up here we have e to the plus i pi psi squared over lambda f. And likewise, we'll have the same thing for the v and the eta. So what's going to happen is that in that case, this term will cancel that quadratic term in psi and eta. And so it seems that we want to take, this would be very convenient to take d1 is equal to d2 is equal to f. Then the quadratic x and y terms cancel, and the quadratic psi and eta terms cancel. So let's see what that leaves us. With our choice of d1 and d2 both being equal to the focal length f, we end up then with our impulse response being, well, we're, we're going to have uh, a phase constant, we'll just call it e to the i phi zero over i lambda f. And all the quadratic terms drop out and it just leaves the linear term, e to the minus i, two pi for lambda f, x psi plus y eta. And phi zero here is just that, uh, Shorthand for 2 pi over lambda, 2f plus n delta 0. Now, the output field then, if we have an arbitrary input field, this is the output field if we have a point source, a delta function. So if we have an arbitrary input field, then we just get g2 of x and y is the integral 
of this impulse response, h of x and y, psi and eta, times g1 of psi and eta, integrated over the entire input plane. And what is that? Well, that's equal to e to the i v0 over i lambda f, that's these constants, just take those out, and then the integral g1 of psi and eta, and then this linear phase factor, e to the minus i, 2 pi over lambda f, x psi plus y eta, d psi d eta. And this is a Fourier transform, right, with u is equal to um, x over lambda f, and v is equal to y over lambda f, because then this, this term here just becomes a e to the minus i 2 pi ux plus vy, standard form. And so what we have is that g2 of x and y is equal to e to the i v0 over i lambda f times big G 1, and this angular spectrum of the input, evaluated at spatial frequencies x over lambda f, y over lambda f. And this is what we get out of our system, which has a single lens of focal length f, an input and output in the front and back focal planes. And hence, we call this a Fourier transforming lens. Pretty amazing that a single lens system like this actually calculates a two-dimensional Fourier transform. Let's look at a simple application of this system. So here we have a lens with focal length f1. And here we have a lens. And let me extend this out a little bit. A focal length f2. And if we think of the ray optics picture, look something like this. That would be a distance f1. This is a distance f1. This is a distance f2. And we take our output plane here at a distance f2. So suppose this input beam has a radius a1. The output beam will have some radius a2. And right in the center, in the back focal plane, we'll call the field there G sub S. Here we'll have an input G1 and an output G2. So from what we've just developed in the previous boards, uh, the field G sub S should be a Fourier transform, essentially, of this input field G1, and then the field G2 should be a Fourier transform of GS. Now, in geometrical optics, what we would have here, if we imagine a set of parallel rays coming in, spread out over a circle of radius A1, uh, those would expand to a set of parallel rays spread out over a radius A2, and by similar triangles here, A2 over F2 should be equal to A1 over F1. So A1 over F1 is equal to A2 over F2, and that means that A2 is F2 over F1 times A1. And so if F2 is bigger than F1, then this would be a beam expander. 
So let's work this out uh, rigorously with wave optics by assuming our input is a Gaussian beam, say that it comes out of a laser. G1 of x and y is some amplitude a, e to the minus pi, x squared plus y squared over radius a1 squared. What is the spectrum of this? Well, we know a nice property of Gaussians is that the spectrum of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So G1 of u and v, we use the uh, scaling theorem there. That's going to be the amplitude a. Uh, we've got a 1 over a squared that becomes a factor a. Uh, we got a 1 over a1 squared that becomes a factor a1 squared here. e to the minus pi a1 squared u squared plus v squared. So the field G sub S here at the back focal plane of the first lens as a function of X and Y would be E to the I. Let's call the phase constant because we have now two lenses with different focal lengths. So the phase constant for the first we'll call phi one and that's over I lambda F one A A one squared. And then we're just filling in here what u and v are their x over lambda f and y over lambda f so e to the minus pi a1 squared x squared plus y squared over lambda f1 squared and let's write that as e to the i phi 1 over i lambda f a, big A, A1 squared, E to the minus pi, X squared plus Y squared over AS squared, where A, so 1 over AS squared must be A1 squared over lambda F1 squared, and so that gives us that AS would therefore be lambda F1 over A1. So we get a Gaussian at the output. It now has a beam radius, lambda F1 over A1. So the larger the radius of the input Gaussian, the smaller this Gaussian is at the back focal plane of the first lens. And then that becomes the field that is the input to the second lens, and we get another Fourier transform. So this Gaussian will Fourier transform to another Gaussian. So let's look at that calculation. So the field in the back focal plane of the first lens, g sub s of x and y, we showed was e to the i phi 1 over i lambda f1, amplitude big A, a1 squared e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a s squared, where a s is lambda F1 over A1. Now, what is the angular spectrum of this field? G sub S of U and V. So all the constants stay there. Now, using the scaling theorem, uh, we're going to get a factor of a s squared out in front and then e to the minus pi a s squared and then u squared plus v squared is going to become x squared plus y squared over lambda f2 squared okay so that's your right because in this case u is x over lambda f2 and v is y over lambda f2. Well, let's define the radius of this beam as a2 is lambda f2 over as. Okay, but what is that? That would be lambda f2, 1 over as is a1 
over lambda f1. And so this is f2 over f1 a1, which just says that the beam has expanded, and this is our a2, by a factor of f2 over f1, which is the prediction of geometrical optics. And so this is equal to, um, what we're actually going to get then out of the lens is we're going to get an e to the i phase factor phi 2, because lens 2 has a different focal length, so slightly different phase factor. We're going to get i lambda f1 times i lambda f2, so we'll get a minus sign from the product of the two i's, and then we'll have lambda squared f1 f2. And then we'll have amplitude A. Now, A1 times AS. Uh, okay, here's AS. A1 times AS is just lambda F1. So we've got that squared. So that's lambda squared F1 squared, or lambda F1's quantity squared. And then we've got E to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a2 squared, where this our a2 is defined here. And we could just make one little tweak there. I'm sorry, this is your g2 of x and y, the output. And the minus sign, we can write that as e to the i pi. So this is e to the i phi1 plus phi2 plus pi. So just some phase constant. And here we've got a lambda squared over lambda squared cancels. F1 squared over F1 is F1, and then you got F1 over F2. So this will be um, actually just that phase constant times A, F1 over F2, E to the minus pi, X squared plus Y squared, over a2 squared, where a2 is related to a1 by this expression. So the beam has expanded now to a radius a2, which is the ratio f1 over f2. And notice what's happened to the amplitude. It's gone down by the inverse, f1 over f2. That just says if I take a, a field, a certain amount of power, and I spread it out over a bigger area, I have less amplitude, less intensity, because that total power is spread out over a greater area. Okay, so that's a rigorous description of a beam expander operating on a Gaussian beam. And the results are consistent with what we get from a prediction from geometrical optics. So here we've got two lenses, focal lengths f1 and f2. This is a distance f1 plus f2. Here's an input. Um, Gaussian of radius A1 in the front focal plane of the first lens and we get an output Gaussian of radius A2 in the back focal plane of the second lens. So here the input is A e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a1 squared. And here the output is e to the i v1 plus v2 plus pi, just some phase constants. a f1 over f2 e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a2 squared, or a2 is the ratio of focal lengths times A1. So again, if F2 is bigger than, a, than F1, then this would expand the beam. And of course, if we wanted to contract the beam, we would just have F1 bigger than F2. Now there's something else you can do with this system. Um, and that is imagine, which is typically the case, that we had a dirty beam. Lasers actually rarely produce a nice, clean Gaussian beam. Um, 
there can be scattering off of dust uh, inside the, the laser cavity, uh, other kinds of effects that can create some kind of scattered fields. And these end up basically causing some plane wave components that are propagating at other angles and create some interference patterns. So imagine our beam looks something like this. A e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a1 squared. It was just a regular nice Gaussian beam. But then because of some of this interference created by some of these uh, imperfections, you get 1 plus, say, some amplitude b cosine 2 pi u0x. Uh, b is less than 1 here, so this thing is never never negative. What would that look like, first of all? Well, here would be our ideal Gaussian beam. And this dirty beam maybe would look something like this. So this sinusoidal variation would give it a very non-ideal characteristic. And that wouldn't be very useful, typically, in an optical system. Let's think a little bit about what you would get in this first Fourier transform for the first lens. And let's just look at one dimension. What would G1 of U be if this was, if this guy here was your G1 of X and Y? Let's just look at the, the X component. Well, it would be the, of course, the Fourier transform of G1 of X, just looking at the X dependence. And that would be, of course, if it was an, a nice, well-formed beam, then that would be nice. That would just be another Gaussian. Uh, but what if instead you have the Fourier transform, like we have in this case, where you'd have g1 of x times an e to the i 2 pi u0x, because the, the cosine, of course, can be broken up as e to the i 2 pi u0 x plus e to the minus i 2 pi u0 x over 2. Well, that's a version of the shift theorem. We know that if you multiply in one domain by a complex exponential like that, you shift in the other domain. So this would be g1 of u minus u0. So the spectrum, what we'd get in the back focal plane of the first lens here, would be from the, from the one term, you'd get the ideal spectrum of the Gaussian. And then you would get two shifted versions from these interference fringes. So if your G1 of X and Y was an ideal Gaussian beam, but then corrupted by an interference fringe, pattern, then your G1 of U and V, the angular spectrum, would be you know, the ideal case from the, from the one there. You just get the Fourier transform of the, the Gaussian. But then from this guy, you get plus B over 2, that same thing, but shifted along the x-axis, uh, which would correspond to the spatial frequency u, so e to the i pi a1 squared u minus u0 squared plus v squared, and then you'd get the same thing but shifted in the opposite direction, u plus u0 squared plus v squared. So in the back focal plane of the first lens, you'd see something like this. Here would be this first Gaussian, and then you would have these other versions of it. It's now u and v. This is shifted over by u0, 
this is minus u0. And so the, the, the interference pattern, the, the dirtiness in the Gaussian beam, produces these two shifted versions of the spectrum. Well, now it's pretty clear what we could do to reconstruct the original Gaussian beam, just block those out. Just pass this through an aperture, say, that allowed the most of the spectrum from the clean beam through and blocked these other components. And that would look like cross-section, uh, side view, would look something like this. So you imagine um, two beams like this. Here is your g s of x and y, and we would put then, say, a pinhole or pupil there that would block out those undesired spectral components. And the radius we would want for that pinhole would be what? Would be the radius approximately of the desired Gaussian, which would we called A sub S, which was lambda F1 over A1. So this is called a spatial filter. You are filtering, you're blocking certain frequency components, and you're doing it in space because the Fourier transforming property of the first lens gives you in its back focal plane the spectrum of the field, the, spa the angular spectrum, laid out in space. And so simply by the components you want to block are just in different regions of space, so you just block them like this. Spatial filter. Let's do an example. Let's say we, we're using a very common laser frequency, uh, wavelength, sorry, 632.8 nanometers, helium neon common wavelength. And let's say our input beam at a radius of two millimeters, and we want have an, to have an output beam expanded out to 50 millimeters. Well, of course, in that case, then we need to have F1, uh, the ratio of F2 over F1 be the same as these, this ratio here. Suppose we use uh, F1 as five millimeters, that would be, let's say, like a microscope objective. Then we would need to have F2 determined by the fact that we would want to have 50 millimeters would be F2 over 5 millimeters, which is F1, times A1, which is 2. From that, you can calculate that F2 has to be 125 millimeters. Now, your AS, then, would be lambda F1 over A1, and you can just crank those numbers through, and you get a value of 1.58 micrometers, microns. So that would be, that's the radius. So the diameter would be about a little more than three microns. And if you buy commercial off-the-shelf pinholes, they would typically come in like five or 10 microns. So we'd probably use a five micron diameter pinhole. Right, it was very, very, very tiny, right? microscopic. So you would pass this beam in the back focal plane of the first lens through this tiny, tiny pinhole. And all the other noisy garbage that you don't want in that dirty beam would get blocked. And what would come out then would just be a nice, uh, desirable Gaussian beam expanded out now to 50 millimeter radius. Now, it's very important that we look at the effects of a finite lens aperture. Uh, after all, if we're drawing our system here, we say we have an input impulse at some point psi eta, and that travels through the lens would be centered at minus psi minus eta. And we say, well, that takes the spherical wave that is emitted by this point source, 
and it collimates it into a plane wave. Well, not really if the lens has a finite aperture AL. It collimates it into a truncated plane wave. And then if that truncated plane wave diffracts as it travels this distance F, then we don't get quite the same result that we've been looking at. So let's, let's take a look at this in more detail. First of all, how would we represent a finite lens aperture? We've been representing our lens, uh, its effects, as a transmittance function, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda, n delta 0, e to the minus i, pi over lambda f, x squared plus y squared. So we're going to add another factor, big P of x and y. We're going to call this the pupil function. As an example, if you just had a limited lens, limited uh, to some circle, you could have this could be circ of r over some radius a, or I guess if we're using al for the lens radius, let's put al there. So our problem is now we're not just propagating a plane wave, we're propagating a uh, truncated plane wave. Let's remember the condition for near field diffraction. The distance we travel, in this case is f, if that is much, much less than the radius of the field squared over the wavelength, then we are in the near field. And approximately in the near field, what we get is just the predictions of geometrical optics. So this field would just would propagate as a little truncated plane wave with negligible um, effects at the edges as long as we're satisfying this condition. Well, let's see, what does that mean? Uh, that would mean that um, F over AL would be much, much less than AL over lambda. Well, the, this is related to the F number of the lens, and that's you know, probably within two orders of magnitude of, of unity. But this is the radius of the lens divided by the wavelength. That, that's probably on the order of uh, you know, 10 to the 5 or at least 10 to the 4 or something like that. So this is definitely true. So that means we can just treat this with the geometrical optics picture here. What would happen there? Well, this, this pupil function would just then be projected onto this center point here, uh, minus psi minus eta, which is just the projection of psi eta through the lens along a chief ray. So if that is the case, then we would modify our impulse response for the Fourier transforming lens to be, okay, it's e to the i phi zero over i lambda f, e to the minus i two pi over lambda f, x psi plus y eta. And now this projection would just be p at x, uh, uh, x minus minus psi, or x plus psi, and then y minus minus eta, or y plus eta. So what happens is you just get the projection of the pupil function along the direction that the plane wave is propagating onto the output plane. And so if we have a pupil function like the circ function, which is either 0 or 1, we can say that if p of x plus psi y plus eta equals 1 for all psi eta x y of interest, then there's no effect. Well, what does this mean? What is this condition? What, what actually are the limitations on that? 
So let's take a look at, at that. When is this true? So imagine this system here we've sketched out. So this is distance F, distance F. This is a lens, focal length F, and a radius A sub L. And suppose in the input plane here, this is a region of interest. It fits within a circle of radius A sub I. So this top point would be in this projection AI, and this would be minus AI. And this is the in the output plane, a region of interest of radius AO. And this would be plus AO and minus AO. And then let's look at this projection of the pupil here from a point that is on the extremity of the input region of interest down here at minus AI. Well, first of all, we'd go through the chief ray through the center of the lens, and that would center the pupil at plus AI in the output plane. And then it would extend to plus and minus AL. And we want that to fully cover to be equal to one over the entire region of interest in the output plane. So we can see here, we want to make sure that uh, minus AO is covered by this truncated plane wave. And that would be mean that AI minus AL should be equal to minus AO. If it was not, if it was larger than that up here, then we wouldn't be illuminating the entire output region of interest. So we need to have that AI minus A lens um, is at least equal to minus AO. Or turning that around, solving for A lens, A lens should actually be greater than or equal to the sum of A in plus AO. The radius of the lens has to be at least equal to the sum of the radii of the two regions of interest. Or if we look in terms of the diameter, diameter of lens must be greater than or equal to the diameter of the input region plus the diameter of the output region. Now, this here in the input, we have some input G1 of X and Y. And we know that at the output, this is a Fourier transforming lens, um, we're going to get E to the I, oops, e to the i phi 0 over i lambda f g1 of x over lambda f y over lambda f, provided this condition is satisfied so that the pupil function is 1 everywhere for all of our calculations. So we get the same results as we would get with an infinite lens. But we know that the input is limited to the square root of x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to, um, well, at the output, it's less than or equal to a0. And at the input, it's less than or equal to a i. So what are the limitations on the spatial frequencies? Well, they're x over lambda f, y over lambda f. And so that would mean that the square root of x over lambda f squared plus y over lambda f squared would have to be less than or equal to, okay, so pull out the 1 over lambda f here. You'd have to have it on both sides. So this would be a0 over lambda f. So that just is taking this equation, dividing both sides by lambda f. And of course, if you want to put the lambda f under the square root, it becomes squared like this. Well, what is this? This here, right, this, you could say this is rho max. That is the max spatial frequency. And of course, this is the maximum spatial extent of the input field. Now, that means that the bandwidth effective bandwidth of the signal is then twice this radius, 2a0 over lambda f. That's the spatial bandwidth. And the sampling theorem says that if you have a signal that has a bandwidth b, you can fully characterize it by sampling with a spatial frequency, which is 1 over the bandwidth. 
So this would be just like your delta x and delta y. In the input plane, you could sample this with this sampling period, and that would fully characterize all the information in that signal. So this is telling us something about the amount of information that can make it through the lens in this system. So suppose this is the input plane, x and y, and we are sampling with some sampling period, delta s. Well, then that defines the dimensions of a pixel. Each sample will be associated with a pixel, which has a pixel area of delta s squared. Now, the total area of the input, well, it's the area of a circle of radius a sub i, so that's pi a i squared. And therefore, the total number of samples in the input would be pi a i squared over delta s squared, or pi pi ai squared, and remember delta s is 1 over the bandwidth, so this 1 over delta s would be the bandwidth, so that'd be bandwidth squared, which is sometimes called the space bandwidth product. For time domain signals, you have a corresponding time bandwidth product representing the number of samples that's required to represent that signal. So this would be the number of samples that would, re would be required by the sampling theorem to represent the input field. So let's see, what is this equal to? This would be pi ai squared. And what was the bandwidth? We said it was 2a out over lambda f, so that's squared. And let's see, what does that give us? Here's a 2 squared would be 4 times pi, so you get 4 pi over um, lambda f squared, a in squared times a out squared. Now, remember we said in order for our Fourier transforming lens to work properly, we have to have the radius of the lens be greater than or equal to the radius of the input plus the radius of the output region. And we can turn that around and say, therefore, the output region has to be less than or equal to the radius of the lens. The radius of the output region is less than or equal to the radius of the lens minus the radius of the input. And so with that, this number of samples becomes 4 pi over lambda f squared a input squared, and then writing this expression for a output, the maximum a output would be a lens minus a input squared. We can think of this as the amount of information transmitted through the lens. And we could say, well, what is the maximum that can be? Well, we could vary AI. Obviously, if AI is equal to zero, then there's, there's no information. If AI is equal to A lens, there's no information. There must be some optimal value. So in the PDF notes, we show that the derivative of the number of samples with respect to the radius of the input region is proportional to that radius, and then proportional also to the output radius, which is A lens minus A input, and also proportional to A lens minus two A input. And we set that equal to zero to get an extreme value. And we find there are three solutions. A n is equal to zero, or A lens minus A n is equal to zero, but that's 
that's just a output so a output is equal to zero but both of those results give you zero samples so that's a minimum and then the third is that a input is one half of the lens aperture and since a out is a lens minus a input one half subtracted from one is one half so that's also the radius of the output region and that's then the maximum and that gives you a system that looks like this so both the input and output region are one half of the lens uh, radius and plugging in then that value into the formula for n samples we get this n samples max possible becomes pi over four times radius of the lens squared over lambda f all squared that's the amount of information maximum amount of information that can be transmitted through the, the lens when it's operating as a Fourier transforming lens as an example suppose the lens was 50 millimeters in radius the focal length of it was 200 millimeters and the wavelength was 500 nanometers roughly green light and then plugging those numbers in to this formula we get ns max is about 31 million samples or pixels And if you arrange those in a square array, it would be about 5540 by 5540 pixel array. So this brings up an important concept. Uh, when we're talking about uh, wave optics, where we have finite wavelengths, the effect of finite apertures or that there's a finite amount of information that can be transmitted through the lens. When we look at an imaging lens, we'll see a similar constraint. And that can, obviously, in an era where we're using digitized uh, imaging sensors, well, that has a direct impact on what size of pixel arrays you use for those.